Welcome to Chinese Medicine in America. My name is Joel Penner. And I'm E. Douglas Kine. We're both doctors of oriental medicine and California licensed acupuncturists. We're also professors of oriental medicine and have been teaching this subject in schools here in Southern California for almost 20 years. Today's topic is the five substances. And Doug will be presenting, so let's turn it over to Doug. Thank you, Joel. You're welcome, Doug. Well, the five substances is a pretty fun subject, and when we say substances, we mean qualities in the human body, and these qualities are necessary for all life, not just human life, all plant life, all animal life. They, uh, they are required for movement and nourishment and reproduction and everything that you can think of uh, related to living beings. And briefly, they are qi, shui, shen, jing, and jin ya. Would you repeat that? I don't know, can I? I, I didn't say can you, I said would you? <laughs> yes, qi, shui, shen, jing, and jin ya. So we're going to discuss each one as we go along. And what was the first one? Qi. G. Yes, it was G. No, oh, Chi. Oh, G. You'll often see Chi, and Chi is very famous actually. You'll often see it uh, spelled C H I or C H E E. But in modern pinyin, which is a romanized way of, of writing Mandarin Chinese, it's spelled Q I. And we pronounce it Chi or Chi. Now, Chi animates everything. That's what's special about Qi. It moves everything. It moves planets around the sun. It moves galaxies away from each other. It moves electrons around the nucleus of the atom. It moves blood. It moves organs. It moves thought. It moves emotions. Anything that requires movement, we're gonna find Qi. And that chi is strongly related to yang. Remember we talked about yin and yang. It's actually part of yang. When you think about movement, <clears throat> you think about friction. Movement creates friction, right? Well, friction creates heat. And what is yang but heat plus movement? So chi is part of yang and will lead to the creation of heat. Now, qi is also very wispy. You can't really capture it. You can't put it under a microscopic slide. You can't capture it and put it in a bottle, so to speak. It's a theoretical concept, but all of this theory that we talk about we call it theory, but it really answers questions. It helps us predict phenomena. So, <clears throat> qi is very, very wispy. I think of qi as energy, mm -hmm. uh, vital force, or I like to call it bioelectric energy. Mm -hmm. That's right. Energy, and we talked about that famous E equals mc squared, energy equals mass times velocity of light. Well, that's that energy, that movement, is, you could say, qi. Now, qi comes from sources, and human qi comes from three sources. That first source, of course, is food. We get that qi from food, and we call that food, we call it gu qi. So you may run into that term, gu qi, gu qi, gu, no, <laughs> qi, gu qi, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and so, now a second source of qi would be air, air, and we call that da qi, da meaning big, air, big atmosphere, da qi, but every time you breathe in, you're breathing in air qi, da qi. The third source of qi is the qi that you inherit. That comes from your genes, and uh, we will call that jing qi, jing qi. <laughs> DNA chi, so to speak. 
She will play specific roles in the human body. We can divide that up into three categories, just for convenience. There's Wei Qi, which is very yang. Wei Qi is on the surface or in any openings of the body because Wei Qi is our protective Qi. Right. So we use that term a lot. We use Wei Qi a lot when we talk about uh, immunity, immunity factors, the immune system. That translates very well in, in Chinese theory as Wei Qi. It's there to stop invaders. It's there to neutralize them and kick them out. <clears throat> then the opposite, you might say the opposite of Wei, Wei Qi is Ying Qi. Ying Qi is the yin aspect of Qi. And Ying Qi we find on the inside of the body. It's Ying Qi that activates organs. It's Ying Qi that moves blood. It's Ying Qi that is interior. And they have a relationship, of course. Wei Qi and Ying Qi relate to each other and they support each other. Too. Ying Qi is also known as nutritive Qi. Nutritive Qi, that's correct. Protective Qi and nutritive, and nutritive Qi. Another aspect of human Qi that we might want to mention is Zong Qi. Zong Qi is also called chest Qi or pectoral Qi. Right. And the reason is that, why is this Qi special? It's because it's always working. I mean, it powers your heart, and powers your lungs, and they never stop. They never stop working. So it's a very strong, sturdy uh, Qi that has great endurance. And it's, of course, extremely important to make sure that Zong Qi, that there's plenty of Zong Qi, and that it's always moving. Right. You don't want to stop breathing, and you don't want your heart to stop beating. Not at all. The second substance that we want to discuss is Shui. And what is Shui, though? Well, Shui is often referred to as blood. So you'll hear these two terms interchangeably. Although, in a Western concept, the Western concept of blood is not exactly the same as the, West, as the Eastern concept of Shui. But we will use those names interchangeably. Now, Shui really has three functions. Now, let's talk about those functions of Shui. Of course, number one and the most important is to deliver nourishment to all the body parts, all the organs and the skin and the uh, tissue all the cells. and everything. Yeah, all the cells, essentially. And we get that nourishment from mainly food and water. So, it's very important that Shui reach all areas of the body. Right. And that it be thick and thick with nutrients. Second function, well, is to add color. Otherwise, everything would be pale. So it adds color to organs and to skin and to everything else. And the third, of course, it brings moisture to the body, so it moistens. So it's very important later on when we talk about pathology, we'll want to see if blood is not doing these functions. If these functions are lacking, well, then we're going to look at Shui and say, well, there's a problem with Shui. Now the nature of Shui, it is a strange animal because it's a mixture of yin and yang. Now on the one hand, uh, it's loaded with yin elements, right? Minerals, it's heavy, it's thick, it's fluid. It's fluid, you can see it, you can put it on a microscope, right? It's, it's heavy and, and thick with copper and iron and things like this. But on the other hand, it's laced with yang chi. It's always moving, and it's warm, especially for warm, but warm-blooded creatures like most of us. Uh, it is warm indeed, so it does have a lot of yang chi in it. The Chinese saying is that uh, <clears throat> chi is the commander of shui, and shui is the mother of chi. That's right, and they actually exist together. They do exist together, and of course, like yin and yang, they complement each other. They're opposites, but they, they support each other. Now also blood, we say that blood is stored in the liver, and here we're talking about your Chinese liver. My Chinese liver your or your Chi Chinese liver? Our Chinese liver. Our Chinese uh -huh. liver. So not your Western liver, that's a whole different thing, that's a different theory. That's a different theoretical system. 
your Chinese liver, everyone has a Chinese liver, and it stores blood. So that will be important later on when we talk about blood pathology, blood, you know, what can go wrong with blood. Blood also is circulated by the heart. It's interesting, in fact, I found it fascinating that the Chinese knew this, that the heart circulates the blood a couple thousand years before it was discovered in the West by Dr. Harvey in the 1700s. But when you, when you read about it in medical textbooks, it was discovered by Dr. Harvey, period. Right. We know that the Chinese knew this from long, long ago. Thousands of years. Ago. Yes, that's right. Now, blood comes from two different sources. The majority of it is going to come from the food and drink that we consume. Right. So we want to consume, of course, high quality food and drink. But a smaller part of that will come from what we talk about in a little bit called Jing, and that is your genetic inheritance. And that, of course, is stored in the, uh, the marrow of the bones. It's all related to Chinese kidney energy. So you're, that, that small percentage of blood, it does come from your genetic inheritance. The third substance that we want to discuss is, of course, my favorite and yours, Shen. I <laughs> think, yeah, it's true. Shen is that substance in the body that determines behavior. Now, a healthy Shen determines behavior that's appropriate. Appropriate to what, you may ask? Appropriate to the entire situation in which you find yourself, each moment, moment by moment. How do you know what's appropriate? The Shen gathers information. It's an information gatherer. And when that shin is clear, that is, it's not obstructed by any, anything else like phlegm or heat or something like that, which we'll talk about later, it's clear and it clearly grasps the information. It can grasp as much information as it can about the entire universe about you and moment by moment determines appropriate behavior, appropriate to your health, essentially. What is healthy for you? What is the healthiest for you? And that includes, of course, your friends and your community and your planet and your solar system and everything else. Right. Shen is traditionally translated as spirit. It is, but it really isn't. I mean, that's not the closest translation. There really is no perfect translation for these terms that we're going through for these um, substances. So, uh, yeah, that you'll see that uh, you'll see that as a translation or as a synonym, but. Um, it is Shen, so we use that term Shen, and the nature of Shen is very young. Because you, you can't, it's just like Qi, you can't bottle it, you can't put it on a microscopic slide. It also resides in your Chinese heart. So we say that the Shen lives in the heart and resides in the heart, and that will be very important later on again when we talk about uh, pathology like insomnia and, um, and other, other problems. Now the basic needs of the Shen, <clears throat> it needs sufficient quantities of everything. It needs yang and it needs yin and it needs qi and it needs shui and it needs fluids. It needs everything and when anything is off, stagnated or deficient, Shen can have some problems which means behavior can be inappropriate. Let's talk about the informational sources of Shen. I like to divide it into two general categories, these informational sources. One is feelings, and the other is intellect. And of course, feelings are yin, and intellect is yang. Right? Feelings is what you receive. Intellect is what you make. And I would divide feelings into two categories as well. There's the physical senses, uh, touch, seeing, hearing, tasting, and smelling. And then there's the emotional feelings. Mad, glad, sad, scared, and all of the shades in between. So all of that is information that the Shen collects. 
And the other half of that informational source, the intellect, I like to divide, well, we could call it abstract thought. I like to divide that into two areas as well. One area is memory. And you remember that uh, people who stepped off that cliff hurt themselves. So that tells you don't step off that cliff, right? And a rational thought. So two plus two equals four. Doesn't equal five or three, it equals four. So that's rational thinking. That's also information. So the shin is gonna need all that information, as much information as possible, to make appropriate decisions regarding behavior. Right, very good. The fourth substance that we wanna discuss is Jing. Jing is very important. Jing, is that substance that determines growth, development, and reproduction. I'll say that again. Growth, development, and reproduction. Jing determines growth. The whole growth process of a human being, for example. The uh, development of a fetus into an infant and into an adolescent. Healthy Jing ensures that the fetus grows as it should during a normal nine-month gestation period. Healthy Jing uh, makes sure that infants and children grow up healthy, that they, that they are growing and flourishing. A healthy Jing will also determine development, development of the individual as the individual goes from child, from infant, adolescent, teenager, adult, mature adult, and into older age and senior. So all of that development is the function of Jing. Can I interject that it's also we also say that Jing is responsible for decline. So as Jing is used up, then we start seeing evidence of aging and diminishment of faculties. And that's correct. Now Jing also dominates the reproductive um, apparatus, reproductive process. So Jing ensures that the species survives. So Jing makes sure that there's plenty of Shui lining the uterus, for example, the, the endometrium, and makes sure that the ovum is healthy and goes down the fallopian tube and meets the sperm coming up and they connect and they develop into a healthy baby and to make sure that people have sexual interests and are interested in uh, reproducing. So that is a uh, definition, you might say, of Jing. Now the nature of Jing, we have to say that Jing is part yang and part yin. It is, of course, stored in the Chinese kidney. And we say, we call the kidney, the nickname for kidney is the root of yin and yang. Well, root of yin and yang really is referring to jing, which is part yin and part yang. The yang, the yin part of jing, is all the material that goes into building bodies, developing and growth. All of the, the ovum itself, the sperm itself, the, the uh, uterus itself, all of these aspects of growth, development, and reproduction that are material, that's the yin part of Jing. We could, we could say that the uh, English uh, translation, not really translation, but the uh, concept of Jing could be uh, closely associated with genetics. Uh, yes, it is, <clears throat> and uh, we'll get into that uh, with that prenatal Jing, which, which we're just about to right. just about to get to. Now that the Yang part of Jing is all of the movement and all of the heat that is required to grow something, to grow a human being or a plant or anything else, and to develop it, and the heat that goes into reproduction, sexual interest, and uh, the heat that is that is required to reproduce the species. So when we talk about prenatal Jing and postnatal Jing, 
That prenatal gene really is that genetic part. Now, natal means birth. So prenatal means that gene that you are born with. Right. That's our genetic material. That's the closest we come to, to that Western concept of DNA, of genetic right. material. And you were born with it. And there's nothing, at this point, there's nothing we can do about that. You're given a certain amount of jing in a certain formation. That jing, that prenatal jing, may contain uh, potentialities for disease. It may even be uh, genetic deformations or <clears throat> or abilities and skills that we're born with. All of this is that prenatal gene and at this point uh, in, in our evolution we can't change that and we can't add to it either. All we can do with prenatal gene is conserve it. We want to conserve that prenatal gene as long as possible, right? Because we want to leave long we want to live long, healthy lives. The way that we do that is with postnatal jing. This is the secret, secret to Chinese longevity. We want to create a lot of healthy postnatal jing so that we can conserve that prenatal jing for as long as possible. The way we do that is by living a healthy life. Right not doing drugs, not da damaging ourselves, not injuring ourselves, and getting plenty of good solid nutrition uh, through food and drink. And good sleep. And good sleep. And good loving. Right. Positive emotions. Positive feelings and all that good stuff. All of that is postnatal jing and we are all about creating that. The fifth substance, and the last substance that we want to discuss, is called Jinya, J-I-N-Y-E. Essentially, Jinya is body fluids. It's not as easy as it sounds, but it's a fun subject, right, Joel? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you get all hot and sweaty. Oh, I love Jinya. <laughs> Well now let's talk about let's break that into two parts, okay? We got gin and we got ya. Yeah. yeah? Yeah. Yeah, I know. So gin is very clear, kinda of like gin, you know, victory gin. Yeah. It's very clear, it's very visible. For example, gin would be sputum. Um <clears throat> perspiration, tears, thin mucus that moistens seminal fluid, lubricating fluids. Ya, on the other hand, is interior, like synovial fluid that protects joints, or spinal fluid. It's interior, it's thick, and you generally don't see it. Now, taken together, this is all Jin Ya. Now we want to talk about the origin of Jin Ya. Where does it come from? Well, we extract Jin Ya from fluids and food that we consume. And there's a whole process of recycling, you might say, of Jin Ya, right. that we need to talk about right here so that later on we'll be able to discuss certain aspects of pathology and what goes wrong. Now this is a, actually a circulation system within the body. Western medicine doesn't, doesn't have a similar concept. No, they don't. They have they have their own theory about the circulation of fluids. Sur yeah. But this works for us, and <clears throat> it is really ingenious the way it's laid out. But first, we need to discuss the concept of burners or jiao, just just to facilitate our further discussion of jin yao. Jiao means a burner or an area of the body that is capable of dealing with fluids. And we're going to divide the thoracic cavity into three parts, or three jiaos. And I will use that term jiao or burner kind of interchangeably. You'll see these used in other textbooks interchangeably. We have that upper jiao, upper burner, which essentially is from the breastbone up here. And it includes the lungs and the heart 
and even even the ants, even the head, that would be considered technically the upper, upper burner, yeah. the upper jowl. Middle jowl is that section between the sternum and the umbilicus, the belly button, this middle section. That would include the digestive organs and the liver, gallbladder, and, and some of the intestines, large intestine. Spleen and pancreas. <clears throat> Spleen, pancreas, all of these organs are in that middle jowl. Lower jowl is anything below the belly button, the right. umbilicus, so it includes kidney, especially, but the, uh, the intestines and the urinary bladder. Right. And even the legs could be considered part of that, an extension of that, okay. So now that we have that concept of burner or jowl straight, now we can talk about the circulation and recycling of gin, yeah. First of all, of course, fluids enter through the mouth and go down the esophagus and into the middle burner. Right. Right? And here, this is like a cauldron. The middle burner is like a cauldron. And it's <clears throat> processing these fluids. The fluids, if they're needed right now, like if you're really thirsty, it's going to go right up into your upper jowl, that part of it, and that's where you get that ah feeling. That's that middle burner sending it right up into the upper burner, giving you that relief, that immediately relief right now from uh, extreme heat. And of course, heat will rise up into the upper burner very easily, right? But the rest of that goes down into the lower jowl, down into the intestines. It's very weighty. Ginia is very weighty, and it falls down, and it falls down into that area, that lower jowl, that is dominated by kidney, and we call that, that area, we, we call that the kidney pilot burner, or the lower jowl. Right. That lower jowl, that lower burner, that's really that kidney life fire, Ming Men, mm -hmm. right. that, is, that will start to heat up that fluid. It's always heating that up, always. And it will separate <clears throat> the useful fluid from the dirty fluid. Right. That dirty fluid becomes urine and goes into the bladder where it's excreted. <clears throat> the clean fluid, the new fluid, will be heated up and turned into steam. Right. In other words, a lot of yang will be imparted into this um, water and it will rise up into the upper jowl where it is collected by the lungs. Right. So the lungs function like condenser coils. They're collecting this steam and then they condense it into water droplets. And this, these water droplets disperse down and out and moisten the entire body. Right. So when you, uh, uh, in surgeries or whatever, when you open up the body, all the organs are moist. There, there's, there's fluids everywhere, and yet there's no vessels through which those fluids flow. Doug is describing the circulation that is extravesicular. Ooh, what a word. Ooh, what a word. <laughs> there's, there's no vessels. It, it's internal, uh -huh. and it moistens uh -huh. the, all of the organs in the uh -huh. body. Uh -huh. That's right. Now, all of that moisture falls down, of course, because it's heavy, right? right? It's subject to gravity, and it falls down into the body cavity, down into the lower jaw, the lower, jaw. The lower burner, where that kidney Ming Men, that kidney fire, that pilot light, always working, starts to boil it again, and where it separates the clear from the unclear. Right. So again, that unusable fluid is sent out to the bladder where it becomes urine and it's excreted. And the usable part is reused. Right. Turned into steam, comes back up into the lungs where it's caught, captured, and condensed and uh, dispersed down and out again. So that's that entire water recycling mechanism that goes on in our body all the time. That's Jin Yao.